Take out our Bibles. Yeah. We're going to start this morning the book of Acts. Acts chapter number 16. And I want to talk about what it means to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Good. Good. Because the word believing, yep. according to the definition of the Bible, really is different from what people generally believe uh, believing is. Yeah. What they understand believing is. There's a big difference there between the world's definition of belief, to believe in something, and the Bible's definition of belief. <clears throat> Acts chapter 16, we'll begin in verse number 30 here. Just a few verses dealing with believing. As the Bible says, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's salvation. But believing is not just, well, I'll jump ahead here a little bit. Believing is not just intellectually believing. Right. Believing involves the will. Biblical believing involves the will. Biblical believing involves the heart. It's not just intellectual believing. Acts chapter 16, verse, beginning verse number 30 here. It says, and, and brought them out and said, Sir, as well, let's back up a little bit here. Let's back up, let's back up to verse number 25. Acts chapter 16, verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praise unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So Paul's in jail. Yeah. You know, the only time that you read in the New Testament about even the Lord, as well as the apostles, witnessing to uh, political figures, they were under arrest. Yeah. This is not a curious thought. The only time they witnessed to political rulers is when they were under arrest or in jail. Even the Lord was under arrest when he witnessed to Pilate. So here, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praise unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. That kind of pictures salvation, the bands being loosed. Yeah. And verse 27, and the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors were open, he drew a sword and would have killed himself. Because if he hadn't killed himself for this kind of uh, uh, incident happening or situation happening, he was responsible. They would have tortured him before they killed him. So it's easier for him to kill himself. That's how bad it was in these days. He drew out his sword and, and would have killed himself, supposing that prison had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. For we are all here yet. Then he called for light and sprang in, came trembling, fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out and, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Yeah. Yeah, there's my thought this morning. Sirs, what, what must I do to be saved? How do you get saved? Saved, forgive me for your sins. Saved right in God's sight again. Verse 31. And they said, Here it is, believe. <laughs> on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Amen. And then it says three more words, thus an end thy house. That doesn't mean that if the father or the main person in the house gets saved, that everybody else is, is automatically saved too. It means their house, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, right. be saved, they have to believe on him also. And the house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord. I like that. They spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house, other ones too. Heavenly Father, please help me as I preach this morning. Lord, I really do ask for and need your extra help today. I'm kind of tired, worn down, don't have the energy I'd like to have. So Lord, just bless now that I'll, you'll help me along that night. Because this time is so important. This time is so important, Lord. People are here. People that you love, people you care about, people you died for, Lord. Some are saved, some are Christians already, and some are not. Maybe even there's some here that are not Christians, but think they are. Lord, they're so deceived. I, I pray to lift that, lift that unbelief, lift, lift that deceit that they're believing right now, too. But I pray, I pray, Lord, that the gospel be given out clearly, that you give me extra help today, Lord, this morning. Because I am kind of worn out from all these things. But I want to preach good today. I want to make it clear. Help me to do that, please. In Jesus' name I pray now. Amen. 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 
I want to talk about what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. Turn, if you would, to John, Gospel of John, now chapter 20 and verse 28. We'll start there. But to believe in Jesus Christ, there's seven things I listed in the bulletin under the first three categories there. I don't know if you noticed that or not, but the first three points in my outline list seven different things. I want to add one more thing to that also about who Jesus Christ is. Yeah. And you need to believe these things to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. You need to believe these things. John chapter 20. We're talking about Thomas here. John chapter 20 and verse number uh, 28 and 29. Thomas was the one that doubted whether the Lord really had appeared, whether he really had resurrected from the dead. And so the first time the disciples met together, uh, Thomas was not with them, but now this is the second time, and he is here. And the Lord shows himself to Thomas. In fact, as the Lord appeared to the disciples here the second time, that was the Lord's first order of business. Yeah. To deal with Thomas, talk to Thomas. Then verse 27, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold thy, my hand, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. Now there's our word, believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, Friends, that's salvation. Yep. That's salvation. Thomas, if he wasn't saved before that, he certainly is now. My Lord and my God. This says in verse 29, Jesus shows that this is a definition of what believing is. Yes. Verse 29, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast what? Believe. believe. <clears throat> what is believing? He believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you've seen you believe. But the Lord's going to talk about another group here in the same part of this verse. Blessed are they that have not seen yes. and yet have believed. Amen. So the, the Thomas here and the apostles, they saw the Lord Jesus Christ. And Thomas believed and he said his definition of believing is having Jesus Christ as his Lord and God. My Lord and my God. That's salvation. Then Jesus said to him, because you've seen you believe, but blessed are those that have not seen and yet believe. And those, you do not have to see Jesus Christ to believe. You don't have to see Jesus Christ to be saved, to become a Christian. You don't have to see him. You can believe uh, through other ways, other means. But you've seen me, you believe, that's okay. But what about those that have not seen? Let me say this too. This morning, everyone who hears this morning that is a Christian, you have not seen Jesus Christ. But you're still a Christian. Because you believed in Him through His Word, Good. the Bible. Now, I'm going to bring up eight things that Jesus Christ did. I'll talk about them quickly, shortly, not a lot of information about each one. But then we'll get into the second part, which I want you to apply personally. Let's talk about who Jesus Christ is. Seven things. First of all, He is God Himself. Amen. Thomas, uh, Thomas said right here, My Lord and my God. To believe on Jesus Christ to the point of being saved, you have to believe that Jesus Christ is God. In fact, you have to accept Him as your God. So number one, Jesus Christ is God. Number two, the Bible says in many, many, many other places, He's also the Creator. He created all things. He's not Jesus the Evangelist. I'm sorry, He's not Jesus the Evolutionist. Right. By the way, He is Evangelist. He's not Jesus the Evolutionist. But He is the Creator. Time and time again, the Bible talks about it. Yeah. First book in the Bible, first chapter in the Bible, first verse in the Bible. What is it? In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. Created. First book in the Bible, first chapter in the Bible, first verse in the Bible talks about what? Creation. Creation. So we believe on him as God, you have to believe on him as creator, you have to believe upon him as judge, he's the judge. Friends, if he's the judge, there's going to be a judgment. You don't have a judge unless there's a judgment coming up. And there's a few different kinds of judgments coming up. But Jesus Christ is the judge. He's going to judge those at the great white throne judgment. Those that have never believed in the Lord Jesus Christ have rejected his love, his salvation. But he is judged. And because he's judged, there's going to be a judgment. And by the way, there's a judgment for Christians too. The Bema seat, we call it. That's when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ ourselves. Christian, are you looking forward to that? 
or not? Are you sure what's going to happen at that day? Now, we're not being judged for our sins. Right. Everyone who's at the people seat of Christ will go to heaven. They are forgiven for their sins. Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. But they're going to be judged by the Lord Jesus Christ, not for their sins, but for their service. How they've served Him since they got saved. So Jesus, Jesus Christ is God. He's creator. He's judge. And He's the absolute truth. Amen. Now, what does that mean, the absolute truth? Uh, that means everything he says, everything he did was always right, yes. never wrong. Yes. In fact, he is truth personified. Amen. He walked this planet and even said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yes, everything that's right in this world is what Jesus Christ is. Everything that's absolute truth in the world was made, originally created by Him. That's right. He made truth and He is truth. That's why we want to be right in that, everything that we say. The Bible is the word of truth. We're talking about being the word of truth in the Bible too. But Jesus Christ is the truth. Jesus Christ is God. He's the creator. He's the judge. He's absolute truth. And, the, and He's the coming king too. Amen. He's the coming king. He's coming back someday. And we believe it's getting close. Do you, do you see what's happening in the world today? Why is Russia acting like it's acting today? You know the Bible talks about that. Why is uh, China becoming one of our fearful, can I use the word enemies? China, China. Is that biblical? Yes, it's biblical. What about everybody dislikes Israel? It seems like the whole, oh, not really. Christians are for Israel. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Secularists are against Israel. Uh, the Mohammedans, they're against Israel. Uh, the Russians, they're not very much in favor of Israel. Uh, China, they're not in favor. It seems that, like the whole world, except Christians and believers, are against Israel. But we're for Israel. What? The Bible says that. That's where Jesus Christ is coming back. You see, there's more happening than just we see. There's what's happening behind the scenes, too. There's spiritual things happening yes. behind the scenes. That's why all these things are happening. It's not just something we can see. It's something we can't see. It's not just the visible world that's happening. It's the invisible world that's happening. Jesus Christ is the absolute truth, and he's king. And he's also called a prince. You know, I thought about that. When was the last time you heard about Jesus Christ being called prince? A prince. You know what that means? It's a military leader. The word prince means he's a military leader. So Jesus Christ is God Almighty himself. Uh, Jesus Christ is the creator of God, not evolution. Jesus Christ is judge. There's a judgment at the great white throne judgment. There's a judgment for the Christians too. And when Jesus Christ was here, he already did some judgments, didn't he? When the one lady that gave that widow's wife, as they were taking the offerings on the Sabbath day back then in the temple, Jesus Christ did a judgment there. He said that little widow lady who gave that, gave that might gave more than all those others that gave a large amount. What was he doing there? He was doing a judgment. Why? Because he's the judge. All judgment is given unto the Son. So he's God, he's creator, he's judge, he's absolute truth, he is king, he's a prince, he's the Lord. Look at Luke chapter 6, verse 46. This is one of our favorite verses around here. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. The Lord questions people who claim to be his. The Lord puts a test in front of them about who is really his. And he questions why they're acting the way they're acting. If they're really his and belong to him, as we would say today, if they're really Christians, why are they acting this way? Luke chapter 6, verse 46. This is a verse we know very well in our church, don't we? The Lord speaking here, and he says, And why call ye me Lord, Lord? Remember, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And why call ye me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Right. Can you really be a Christian, called Jesus Christ Lord, 
if you're not obeying him. We'll talk about that here in a little bit too. Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. If you really call me Lord, then obey me. Then do what I say. If you're not doing what I say, then don't call me Lord. And he confronted them with that, didn't he? So he is that. He's Lord and he's Savior. Praise the Lord. He is the Savior. God is our Savior. God is our Savior. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Other places in the Bible, many places in the Bible talks about that. So Jesus Christ is who? God himself. God Almighty. Uh, here's a quote. I wanted to add this in. In Jesus Christ, we see all the perfections of God in a man. Think about that. In Jesus Christ, we see all the perfections of God in a man. Next time you read through the Gospels or any portion of the Gospels, realize that man walking this planet was God himself. God manifest in the flesh. So again, we say it again. In Christ, we see all the perfections of God in one man. One man. So Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is creator. Jesus Christ is judge. Jesus Christ is truth, absolute truth. Believe what he says. He's absolute truth. Believe the word of God, the Bible that we have today. Jesus Christ authenticated it. <coughs> Jesus Christ is king. Jesus Christ is prince. Jesus Christ is Lord. And Jesus Christ is Savior. That's a lot of things to believe. Let me say this. Here's the main part of my message this morning. I want to, I want to make this personal in our lives. You can believe all those things intellectually and not really be a Christian. You can believe all those things just intellectually. There's other things involved in this. One of the situations we have is people that think they're Christians and they go around and they talk, even talk about the Lord. And they believe He's God and they believe He's Creator and they believe He's Judge. They believe He's Truth. <coughs> they believe He's King. They believe He's Prince. They believe He's Lord. They believe He's Savior. But it's just on an intellectual basis. Yeah. Just intellectually. They just believe. I was listening to Brother Bruce Musselman's report at the radio program a few weeks ago. And he talked about this too. He talked about this. This intellectual faith is not biblical faith. Here's what makes the difference. Here's how he personalizes it. Number one, to believe on Jesus Christ biblically, you have to put him first in your life. Now we're not talking sinless perfection. We're not talking that everybody has to spend 24 hours, uh, 24 hours, seven days a week in church. I'm not saying that, but turn to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Amen. You have to believe on him, put him first in your life. Amen. Amen. People need to put him first in his life. They need to put his word first in his life. They need to put his church first in their life. They need to put everything about him first in their life. First is an important place. First is God's place. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says... But seek ye first, there it is, that's the important word first, the kingdom of God. And his righteousness, the righteousness of God, needs to be your first priority in your life, God's righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Those are the word things. Things. So, so you have a choice. You can seek God first, or you can seek things first. My brother passed away a number of years ago now, but he had one funny little story, little, little thought he had. He, he, he says, everywhere you go in the house, you find stuff. <laughs> Amen? I mean, you open up a closet door. What do you find inside that closet door? Stuff. You go down the basement. What do you find packed up on the shelves in the basement? Stuff. You go out to the garage. You look around the garage. What do you find around the garage? Stuff. Our lives are filled and loaded with what? Stuff. That's the things that are talked about here. Isn't God more important than those things? Yes, sir. Isn't God more important than that stuff? And God is saying here, the Lord's saying here, make the right choice. Don't live for those things. Don't put those things first in your life. Put me first in your life, the Lord says here. Put the Lord Jesus Christ first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What is first in our lives today? It matters what's first in our life. You can believe all those seven, those eight different things that uh, I mentioned earlier. But what is first in your life today? What is first there? Stuff, things, or God? Things will not get you to heaven. 
of the Lord Jesus Christ's will. But what is first in your life? And doesn't he deserve first place? Here's a question. I want, I want to stay with you this morning. What is more important than him? What deserves first place in your life? Other than him. What he said is true in the Bible. The way he asked, what he promised, what he prophesied. All the blessings that he can give. What is the most important thing in your life? Is it the Lord Jesus Christ? Put him first, first in your life. Not things. Yes. Things that'll be gone. Once you leave this world, you're going to leave them all behind. Right. I was thinking of that one man, they, I forget his name now. He, he, they call him the richest man in the world. George Soros, Elon Musk, I forget, one of those two. He, you know what he's worth, what I heard on the radio? $176 billion. Yes. You know what that is? That's a lot to leave behind. That's a lot to lose. For what shall it profit a man if he have gained the, the whole world? And lose his own soul. 176 billion dollars. I wouldn't even know what to do with all that money. I don't need that guy. I don't need. I don't need that anyway. I don't want things to be first place in my life because we're going to lose them all. Leave them all behind, aren't we? Yeah. Leave all. That's a lot. The more you have, the more you leave behind. Yeah. The more you have, the more you lose. Yeah. Why live this life just for things and that stuff that gets piled up in your closet? And in your garages and in your basement. Why live for just something like that? Why not live for the Lord God Almighty that He gives you eternal life? That'll be with you forever. And you can be with Him forever and ever and ever. What choice is that? That's an easy choice for me to make. Easy choice. I pray if you haven't made that choice yet, that you will. Stuff, things, or God Almighty. What is the first place in your life? You can believe all those things, those 70 things I mentioned earlier. We need to put them first, though. That's Bible believing. We need to put them first. Number two, who do you love the most? Similar, but the Matthew now, chapter 22. Matthew 22. Who do you really love the most? Do you love God the most? The Bible says in another place, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Matthew 22, though, I want to go here now. Verse 37. Matthew 22, and we're beginning verse 37 here. Do we love him? It's not just believing it intellectually, but do we love him? By the way, the word love, you have to understand it from the Bible definition, what the word love is. It's not just emotion. Most of you can be involved in it. But the world's definition of love is so different from the Bible's definition of love, too. Yeah. Like I said already, but several times this, this morning, what a difference in the Bible's definition of words. But here's another one. When the world uses the word love, what do they think of? Sadly, a lot of times it's something sensual. What does the Bible call that? Filthy. Lustful. Sensual. Those kind of things. When the Bible uses the word love, it's talking about an unselfish, others-directed emotion and feeling. And let me say this. Decision. The Bible definition of the word love is not just an emotional feeling. Oh, friends, don't follow your feelings. Be careful of that. Sometimes your feelings will lead you the right way, but a lot of times they'll lead you the wrong way, too. Do what the Bible says. But the Bible definition of the word love is to choose to do what's right and to do what's right, whether your feelings go along with it or they don't. I'm glad a lot of times my feelings go along with it, and I feel good about things. I, I feel good about preaching the Word of God. I feel good when I, I see a lot of people in church. I feel good when the, I hear the gospel being preached and people get I like that. I read the Bible. I do all these things. I feel good about those things. But that's not what directs me. I use my will, my choices, to serve the Lord whether I feel like it or I don't. Like I've said recently, emotions are the caboose on the train. They're not the engine. And they're not the cars. They're just the caboose. They just follow along. So be careful. Be careful there. Matthew 22. Now let's read this. Matthew 22, beginning of verse, uh, verse 35. Matthew 22, beginning of verse 35. 
It's always good to get the setting of these verses and why they're happening. In fact, go we'll back up to verse 34. Amen. Matthew 22, verse 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, now the either, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ, they were gathered together. Now, verse 35. Then one of them, you know, it's always, uh, it takes some kind of, a type of courage to be one, to speak up when others are keeping quiet. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, it's not all a bad thing, Ask him a question. Now, here's the motive in back of this question, tempting him, though. He was not asking him a question to learn something. It was not a sincere question. It was a tempting question. Yeah. Ask him a question, tempting him, and say, Master, now, Master, that's not bad. That means teacher. If he had said Lord, that would have meant something a whole lot different, wouldn't it? Yeah. But he doesn't say Lord there. He says, Master, that says something right there. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Now, commandments, commandments. People don't like commandments. But notice what Jesus says here in verse 37, how he defines, how he defines the commandment. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. You know what here it says in verse 38? A commandment, is, God's commandment is to love. Love is a commandment. If you don't love somebody, you need to. It's a commandment. Because we can choose to do that by acting in a certain way. It doesn't matter what our feeling, feelings are at times. We need to love people because it's God's commandment to love people in the right way. Again, not the world's definition. Their, their definition is filthy. Their definition of work, uh, love is so wrong, so unbiblical. We need to have the right biblical definition of the word love and then do that. And do that. This is the first and great commandment. To love, love is a commandment. God commands us to love. To act lovingly towards people, even if we don't feel like it. Yeah. Friends, don't let emotions run your life. Yes. Your emotions are running off, a, off the edge of the cliff. Your emotions will lead to be angry. Your emotions will lead you to be discouraged. Yeah. Your emotions will lead you to be depressed. Right. Your emotions will lead you to quit. Yeah. Yes. Be careful of your emotions. They're not always your friends. Yeah. Do what God says whether you feel like it or not. And then after you do that, you're going to find your emotions go along with what, you, what they should be. Your emotions will change. There's joy, joy in a person's life because they, they come out to church. Amen. Inviting people out to church, there's a joy here in this church building. Uh, Christians have a joy in their life. But let me, let me move on. Now. But this is the first great commandment, and then it continues on. And the second is like unto it. And guess what? It also talks about love. The second commandment talks about love too. Not the world's definition of love. Not a lustful kind of love. Not a selfish kind of love. Not a sinful kind of love. But a Bible kind of love here. In verse number 39 it says, love in the definition of commandment here too. And this is the second, second great commandment. is like unto it, similar. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Amen. As thyself. You know what to say? We already love ourselves. We all love it. That's pride. That's the word. We love ourselves. That's what it's saying here. You're to love people as much as you love yourself, if not more than you love yourself. Yeah. So what's it saying there? The commandments of God involve love. See, we people criticize the commandments. Oh, that's legalism. No, it's not legalism. Not that you understand the Bible definition of commandments. It's love. Yeah. Real love. Not worldly love, not sensual love, not that kind of love. Real love, where you decide to choose to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether you feel like it or you don't. Emotion, emotions can be involved, absolutely. That's part of our makeup too. But if you really love God, you really believe on Him, you're going to love Him by the Bible definition of the word love. Amen. So you can believe on Jesus as being God, as being creator, judge, truth, king, uh, prince, uh, Lord, Savior. You can believe all those things, 
But that doesn't mean you're a Christian if it's just intellectual believing. It's when you put him first in your life here, like it says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And like you need to love him, like it says in Matthew 22, verse 37 and 39. And the third one also, another way to define biblical believing is to serve him. To serve him. Uh, turn to Luke again, back to, or over to Luke chapter 4, verse number 8. We already read Luke chapter 6, verse 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? And Luke chapter 4, verse 8. Other verses in the Bible do talk about this. When a person really is a Christian, they want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Apostle Paul got saved there, when he got saved, that day he got saved, recorded the Bible in the book of Acts, the first thing he said is, what wilt thou have me to do? Yeah. What does that mean? What do you, how do you want me to serve? What do you want me to do? You're turning, he turned his will over to Jesus Christ that day. That's what salvation is. Turning your will over to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. I wasn't going to do this, but maybe I will. You know the old vacation Bible school song or Sunday school song about obedience? I'm going to sing it to you, so get ready to enjoy this. <laughs> now, I don't remember all of it, but let's see how well I can do. Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. Doing exactly what the Lord commands. Doing it joyfully. Then it goes out a little before I, I can't remember the next part, but here's the end. O B E D I E N C E. Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. chapter 4, verse number 8 here, it says, thank you. It says here, Jesus answered and said to them, get thee behind me, Satan. So this is when the Lord was in the wilderness and the devil, Satan, was tempting him. And again, verse 8, and Jesus answered now, answered the devil's temptation, said, and, and said to him, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written. You see, sometimes, even people that don't believe the Bible can quote some of the Bible. Right. And how do you answer that? Well, answer like the Lord did. Quote the Bible. Get thee behind me, saying, For it is written, there is a good way to deal with it. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, amen, and him only shalt thou. See? Get it? Yeah. You understand what I'm trying to say this morning? You can believe all those, six, all those eight things I mentioned earlier. I'm not going to go through that list again. You can believe all those things, but unless you have, have put Jesus Christ first, not, not, I'm not talking sinless perfection. I'm not talking about Christian being perfect. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying it's an attitude we need to have to put him first in our life. And when we have decisions to make, we, we consider what his will is and what his word says about it. And we're going to do what Jesus says Amen. first in our lives. Amen. Number two, we need to love him. Again, that's not the world's definition of love. Be careful of that. I think I made that clear. But we need to love him with a Bible love. Choose to reject sin, self, and now yeah, Satan too. But also here is serve him, serve him. To serve the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus answered the devil when he was tempted by it is written. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. No serving, it makes you wonder. No obedience, it makes you wonder. No love for the Lord and all the things of the Lord, it makes you wonder about people. I'm not causing you, I was, was going to say this, I'm not causing you to doubt your salvation, but I'll, I'll, I'll back up on that. Yes, I am. Good. Because I want you to be concerned enough to look in the Word of God. That's my point. I want people to look in the Word of God, find what the Bible says. You can't have confidence. You can't know for sure that you're saved. You can't know for sure you're going to heaven someday. And that's what I want for you. But I also... You know what some of the scariest verses in the Bible are? Turn to Matthew chapter 7, and I'm done this morning. This is my last point. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. This scares me the most. In fact, sometimes, you know, honestly, sometimes I skip over this part. But it's real. And the Lord warns us. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Uh, says, not everyone, by the way, this is the Lord speaking here. Not everyone that saith unto the Lord, 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 
shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. There's a difference there. Again, not perfection, not Christians aren't perfect, but there's a difference in attitude. Now verse 12, 12, 22. Many, how many? Many, a lot, will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Prophesied, they preach the word. And, to thy, and in thy name have cast out devils. Spiritual power to do those kind of things. And in thy name done many, many wonderful works in the name of Jesus Christ. Done many wonderful works. Now look at verse 23. If you dare. I dare you to look at verse 23 now. The Lord's answer. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. I never did. Even while you're doing all those things in my name, I never knew you. I wasn't in the back of that. I never knew you. Uh, the first part of verse 23 is real good. The second half is even worse. <laughs> Depart from me. He that work iniquity. Yeah. Boy, the confidence and assurance that the Lord can give when a person is really saved. But there's so many people in this middle area, too. Middle area. Yeah, you can believe. You can believe a lot of things about the Lord. And not, it's just intellectual, not go to heaven. You can believe he's God. You can believe, go to the right kind of churches that preach the deity of Christ. You can believe he's greater. Right? Like, take a stand against evolution. You can believe that. You can believe judge. He's true. He's the king. He's the prince. He's the Lord. He's the savior. He's coming back a second time. You can believe all those things. Or have those last three points true in your life. Mm -hmm. About real Christianity. Is he first in your life? Here's an old illustration I've used many times in our church. It's our, our regular people. Please forgive me for using this again. As a young, young, well, young associate pastor working in another church, we had a baptism one day, and afterwards I was listening to, I happened to listen to one, one young man that had gotten baptized there. I was listening to him, he was talking to someone else, and he said, well, now that that's all over with, meaning a baptism, I can get on with my life. And I think about that, I'm thinking, you know, when a person really believes in, in the Lord, Jesus Christ becomes their life. Amen. Yeah. 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 Amen. Yeah. Amen. If someone really has believed in the Lord, Jesus Christ becomes their life. Yeah. The Apostle Paul then wrote, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? A surrendered will. You can believe intellectually a lot of things about the Lord, but notice those last three points are true in a person's life. There's not real salvation there, friends. Please, please understand what I'm saying this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the invitation we're about to have now. Thank you for all those that are here. But I want to take a couple minutes, five minutes, and have this invitation time too. I pray, Lord, you work in people's hearts. For those that are saved, praise the Lord. They'll understand it better and rejoice even more. And we'll have even greater confidence. For those that are not saved, they'll understand that too, please. In Jesus' name now, I pray that you'll bless this prayer time, this invitation time. In Jesus' name, amen.